Colorado's farmers are jealous of the rain we've been getting here in the metro area because this season has been especially rough. It's far enough now that, that the rain, it can't bring it back. Some of the kids who fell behind during the pandemic are catching up to where they should be, but state testing shows others have a lot of work to do. Some banks are holding off cashing those Tabor checks you just received. Why the paper they were printed on may be causing some issues. The folks who got a rebate through Denver's e-bike program seem to be loving their bikes. Data shows some of them are riding every day. And let's try something new together that could make a difference for years to come. Next. There are people in Colorado who pray for year for, for rain all year long. Those wild downpours that we saw over the last couple of days came too late for some of the people who need it the most. Mark Salinger shows us farmers on the Eastern Plains have already lost a big portion of their crop after a hot and dry summer. Family's been here for 103 years now. On Colorado's Eastern Plains, the focus is on the future. As Luton Farms hopes next year, is better than this one. Personally, it's the worst year I've ever experienced for, for crops. All that rain we saw over the last couple of days came far too late for Curtis Luton. Weather is everything. His farm in Bennett is already preparing for the next season, knowing this year's crops are nearly all gone. It's far enough now that, that the rain, it can't bring it back. He says he's lost 80% of the spring crop he was planning to harvest this fall before the heat and wind killed it all. This is what the, the dry land corn, the majority of the dry land corn in eastern Colorado looks like. While much of the state gets much needed rain, pulling us out of a drought, parts of the eastern plains aren't so lucky. Bennett, where Luton Farms is, saw three inches of rain between June 1st and August 15th. That's only about 66% of the amount of rain the area should have in that time. Compare that to the metro area that's seen four to six inches of rain in those months. It, uh... It started off real good, but we had the four weeks of wind and 100 degree weather. And in the past two days, they've seen 0.61 inches of rain. Still, parts of the metro area got more rain in just a couple of days than Bennett has seen all year. The rain Curtis did see is enough to give him hope. It's too late for, for this year's crop, but we desperately need it and we need more. A love-hate relationship. It's impossible to do anything about weather. Always hoping for more rain. Now, this is what the most recent drought map that was released last week looks like. When it, The new one is released tomorrow. We're expecting to show more blue. This one behind me doesn't account for those most recent so, or, uh, rainstorms that we had, Steve, in these last couple of days. It really just goes to show you that even when there's one part of the state that gets absolutely drenched, others can see far less rain. It's not like this is just a, a, a problem this year. This has been a problem for a while. Yeah. yeah. Curtis tells me that he hasn't had a really good year since 2019. So when you account for three years of drought and just dry weather, it makes farming really hard. Yeah. Yeah. We're hoping for rain for all of them. Mark Salinger, thank you. We're getting our first real look at how Colorado's students are doing two years after the pandemic. Today, the State Department of Education shared the state assessment test results for this spring. It's the first time since 2019 that the state did its normal testing, and it shows that Colorado kids have a lot of learning loss to recover from. Let's start with the good news. Third graders in Colorado did almost as well on their tests this spring as third graders did before the pandemic. A great sign given that those kids were in first grade when the pandemic upended school. But older students in most grades and subjects did worse than in 2019. Seventh graders saw some of the biggest drops in percentage of students meeting or exceeding expectations in math and English. Those kiddos were in fifth grade in the spring of 2020. That's when they're really working on things like their fractions, which are critically important. We need to be checking for those missing pieces and be filling them in as students engage meaningfully in their grade level curriculum. There are still big gaps for black, Hispanic, and low-income students compared to white students. The test data shows, for the most part, those gaps only got smaller, but only because white students did worse. No one got better. The only other piece of good news here, some grades got tested last year, though participation was low. It's not completely apples to apples, but this year's scores do show some improvement from 2021. 
People are dying on our roadways at a rate we haven't seen in 20 years. That's the takeaway from the new estimate of traffic deaths from the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration. Their data always lags a bit, so the report released today only looks at the first three months of 2022. Road deaths increased sharply during the pandemic in 2020, and they just continue to increase. The, the more than 9,000 deaths estimated on the roads nationwide in the first quarter of 2022, that represents a 7% increase over the same time last year, the most since 2002. Here in Colorado, NHTSA data shows traffic deaths were up nearly 10% in that same time, the first quarter of this year, compared to the same time last year. In Denver, 54 people have died on the roads so far this year. The city is on pace to nearly match last year's total of 84 road deaths. Last year uh, the, saw the most deaths on Denver roads since the city embraced a Vision Zero plan to end all traffic deaths by the year 2030. Nearly two out of three Tabor refund checks have been cashed. The state announced one and a half billion dollars has been received by residents depositing their state refunds. It would be more if not for some banking institutions concerned about the state's ability to actually pay this money. We've heard from quite a few of you having issues cashing your checks. So we had politics guy Marshall Zellinger check into it. Boy, this just this just doesn't smell right. Something. You know, why would they hold state funds? When Tim Fields deposited his Tabor refund check with U.S. Bank, his money was put on hold. And I just thought that was odd for a state-issued check. A few days later, his bank told him why. We're going to put a hold on the check. Uh, we're taking this action because we have information that leads us to believe that the check, the check may, may not, not be paid. It happened to Sarah Chatfield, too. Looking at my savings account, and it says, when you made this transaction, these funds were held. We normally talk to Sarah as a political yeah. science professor. It is. It is kind of politics, but in a different capacity. <laughs> Today, she just wants her money. If you're going to make a big deal of sending out money to people, and you know we're calling it the Colorado cashback, um, and then if it becomes a chore and people have to go through all these extra steps to figure out where their money is, I can't think that's a good luck. So what happened? According to the state, it goes beyond U.S. Bank and is limited in how many people were affected. But it did require a bulletin from the Department of Revenue, letting banks know of certain aspects of the check that are not fraud indicators. The one that caught my eye, the paper stock is a lighter weight. In fact, I still have the check here. And it, you know, it seems normal. Department of Revenue Executive Director Mark Ferrandino told the banks DOR is working to ensure every banking institution understands the legitimacy of these checks and encourages all institutions to cash or deposit these funds. In my case, we weren't counting on this money to pay for a major expense. But a lot of people may have needed the money uh, for whatever things, you know, it could be food on the table or whatever. And in those instances, it would be more than an oops. It could be a huge deal if a person was thinking they were going to use this money to pay for rent or food. There is a phone number you can call to try to talk to a customer service rep about Tabor refund check problems. We've heard from some of you with issues getting through. I tried this morning, and after a two-minute recording telling me, one, about the check, and two, why I should wait if I didn't get it yet, I finally got put in queue for a two-minute hold. You couldn't hit zero to bypass this. You had to listen to the recording. Last week, the call center had 15 employees answering 1,400 calls a day. Average wait time, not at 9 a.m., 30 minutes average wait. And we should note that you made sure to get off in case somebody else wanted to get on. Like, you didn't, hey, that's you a didn't good point. wait yeah. two minutes. I didn't right? block it for somebody else. What are people calling about? Uh, where's their check? Uh, do they qualify for a check? An address change? I think I heard... One, I can't, I, there's a very small percentage, it was either 1% or less than 1% that had address issues. Um, and the third thing is, I'm drawing up, darn it, I should have put it in the prompter so I wouldn't forget. There was, <laughs> I the third was thing was something else, but again, like whatever your question is, is like, where's my check? Or, oh, it was about intercepting money. Like, why is my check, which we covered before, why is my check less money than 1500 or 750 It's because if you owe um, child support or some other money that can get taken out, they're taking that out they're first. They're garnishing it. Yeah, yeah that's the working it. All right. Marshall Zellinger, always remembering things. Appreciate it. <laughs> well, every week we work together to help nonprofits help our neighbors. Here's Kyle with more on this week's Word of Thanks. Want to see the American dream at work? Go to the East Colfax community. Immigrants and refugees from around the world are trying to build safe, productive lives for their families there. 
It's a community crying out for help after the killing of Ma Kang, a longtime neighborhood leader. She was shot and killed by a stray bullet as she unloaded her groceries. Her son and their neighbors are pleading for help with public safety and for the opportunities for a better life that they came to this country to find. I heard recently that immigrant advocates were trying to put together college scholarships for people in that community. They had gathered enough money to help four people. I know that we can build on that together. So tonight, in partnership with the nonprofits of the Refugee Action Coalition, our word of thanks donations will establish the Ma Kang Scholarship Fund. This is our first for our weekly microgiving campaign, setting up a whole scholarship fund. My hope is that we can create something special and lasting and keep it going year after year. The Ma Kang scholarships will be awarded to immigrants and refugees who are entering higher education, newly welcomed Coloradans who want to put their talents and more education to use in supporting our communities. The demand for these scholarships has been huge, far more than just the four they originally planned. They've heard from students who plan to study early childhood education, nursing, neurosurgery, engineering, teaching, business. Ma Kang didn't just dream of a better life in this country. She was working hard to build it for herself, for her son, for her neighbors. In her memory, we are going to help immigrants and refugees from her community reach their dreams of an education and a path to a better future for their families. Scan the QR code on your screen or text the word thanks to 303-871-1491 and I'll send you that link to donate. As always, even $5 helps, so I'll match the first 50 donations of $5. Ma Kang believed in the potential of her neighbors. I do too, and so do you. The scholarship fund that we will help create tonight is going to change lives and change our community for the better. Denver helped pay for their e-bikes. New data shows they're getting their money's worth. Leaders in a rural Colorado community say yes to solar as long as it comes with sheep. You're able to kind of do whatever you want with poetry and you can say whatever you want to say. She uses writing to capture her hometown's story. We'll meet Aurora's new top poet in the place where she found her love of words next. We're getting our first data on how much people are using the bikes that they got through Denver's e-bike rebate program. A company called Ride Report, which tracks rider data on shared e-bikes and scooters, launched a new app that lets people who got an e-bike through Denver's rebate program track their rides. They found half of the 42 people logging their rides on the app so far have used their new e-bike every day they've had it. The average trip is a little over three miles. The average length of a trip, about 20 minutes which could easily replace an average car trip in Denver. Ride app automatically logs any trip, trips you take on your e-bike. The data is used to help promote e-bike incentive programs across the country. It's also shared with some planning departments to help determine where people are riding and what areas might need some better infrastructure. An energy company will get its big new solar project in Delta County. After all, sheep were the key here. Told you about this earlier in the week. The county commissioners shot down a new solar development because they were worried about losing agricultural space. So the company came back to them with a new proposal. Same solar panels, but with sheep underneath. They could graze there. Yesterday, the commissioners voted unanimously to approve this project. About 1,000 sheep from a local farmer will graze under the 475 acres of solar panels. It's a strategy that's becoming more common as solar projects expand. People grow crops between the panels, set up beekeeping operations there too. Researchers at NREL in Golden are looking into the best soils and plants to use in fields like this. Well, great grazing weather out there today. We've got a lot of sunshine. We're at 82 degrees right now at DIA. Winds coming in from the east at around 11 miles per hour. Most of the urban corridor in the lower to mid 80s, you can see those warmer temperatures further northeast. And then cooler as you make your way further south and southwest. The high country in the 50s, 60s, even 70s. Pretty warm out west, 90 right now in Grand Junction. We do have another air quality alert that will be in effect until 4 o'clock tomorrow. This has been extended for another 24 hours. Outside of that, we're going to continue to monitor these very spotty storms storms far southwest, none of them making their way into Denver. So tonight we're going to be mostly clear. Those temperatures near 58 degrees. And then the next couple of days, we'll see those temperatures a little warmer. We're in the upper 80s, seasonal dry tomorrow before things cool down this weekend with more storm chances. 
She's had a way with words since she was little. I would actually choose to stay inside and write instead of going to recess. <laughs> Aurora's first poet laureate of the pandemic shares how her hometown helped her love for writing grow. Next. Aurora has a new poet laureate. Last Monday, the city council appointed Asia Fox, the third person to hold the role and the first since the pandemic. Fox grew up in Aurora and we caught up with her where her love for words blossomed. I have been coming here since I was in middle school. And so I would walk here all the time and I would do my homework. I've actually written some poems here. And so this library means a lot to me. So my name is Asia Fox and I am the newly appointed Aurora Poet Laureate. This hand must not be mine. It is a dress for what I think is me, an entity. I've been writing since I was a kid. Um, I would actually choose to stay inside and write instead of going to recess. <laughs> Once I started taking writing seriously, all I wanted was to spread the good news and the joy. And mainly I want others to also know the power of poetry. And this poem was inspired by the 135 bus that goes up and down chambers. Here we are under someone else's thumb again. We await the customary swipe no flick, no pink river pulsing against our backs. Being raised here, um, I've gone through a lot of things. I went through the school system. I know a lot of people in the neighborhood. It feels like a little encapsulated world that I can tap into whenever I want because I live here and I love having that in my work. This hand has done much. Um, my goal Excellent. is to teach others and to also inspire others to do the same thing um, and to introduce them to poetry because it's a very powerful thing. All of us are going through something and I think Poetry is a great way to use your voice and try to articulate and define how you feel like the world is going around you. Last one. What has she taught you otherwise? You're able to kind of do whatever you want with poetry and you can say whatever you want to say. Thank you. Asia won me over with the RTD poem. She spoke to Nine News photojournalist Mike Grady. Asia will hold that position for the next four years. We'll finish with your feedback next. Ma Kang wasn't just a dreamer, she was a doer. She was a pillar in the East Colfax community, populated by refugees and immigrants new to our country. Ma Kang was recently shot and killed. Her dream of a better life for her neighbors lives on through what we are helping create tonight, the Ma Kang Scholarship. These will be awarded to refugees and immigrants who are entering higher education to better their own lives and improve their community. Scan the QR code on your screen or text the word thanks to 303-871-1491 to join me in giving. Together with the nonprofits of the Refugee Action Coalition, we're going to build something special with the Ma Kang Scholarship to lift up people who are seeking a better life in our community who just want to give back to Colorado. Try to get all your feedback in before I uh, run out of time here. Matt wrote in, does Next have a coverage cam overlooking the bull ride at Waterworld? It's like the downtown cam sought behind Marshall Zellinger. That's actually the bull ride at Elitch Gardens, I believe. And Becky Bollinger said, heads up. She's the assistant state climatologist. It's rained a lot here, but drought improvement could be slower than expected.